The question is that this House do now adjourn. Mr. Stephen Metcalf. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, for giving me the opportunity to express the grave concern that surrounds yesterday's announcement that the Corriton oil refinery in my constituency will close. When the company was placed into administration five months ago, I think many of us believed that because of its profitability and its productivity, it would not be long before it found new owners. So I have to say, five months later, and with no buyer coming forward to operate the site as a refinery, this is a very sad day and a debate that I had hoped we would never have to take place. The intention of my debate before the announcement was to lay out that this was not just another business in administration. It was to explain to the House and to the Minister the importance, strategically, economically, socially and historically. But before I proceed, can I place on record my heartfelt thanks to everyone who has been working so hard over the last five months to keep the refinery operating? I will. Uh, can I just associate myself with those comments and pay my own personal tribute to my honourable friend who has worked tirelessly behind the scenes yeah, to bring together yeah, yeah, all the yeah. interested parties and he's done so with dedication to achieving the outcome, not by dedication to generating column inches, which has been the characteristic of some members opposite. Will he also agree with me that the, the Minister uh, sitting at the dispatch box today has also been absolutely sincere in his commitment to achieve a positive outcome for the refinery? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I thank you very much for those comments? And yes, I would like to thank uh, the Minister personally for uh, his help and support, but also to thank Ministers from Biz and from the Treasury for what they have done to help me try and find and work with uh, all those involved to find a solution. But those who have worked, I'm afraid we have limited time. Can, uh, no, we have limited time, I'm sorry. To the, but the people I want to thank the most are the staff, the management, particularly uh, John Barden and Georgina Clark, and of course the unions. It is without their commitment that the business may well have closed month, months ago. Yeah, yeah, Instead, yeah, yeah. it has had time to search for a buyer and to explore a range of options that might have led to securing its long term future. The refinery has changed ownership many times over the years, most recently in 2007 when it was acquired by a Swiss company called Petra Plus and became one of a group of five refineries. Unfortunately, in January this year, the parent company, Petra Plus, got into financial difficulties and filed for bankruptcy. It was at that point that Corriton placed itself into administration with PricewaterhouseCoopers, PwC. Of one of the five, of the five, Corriton is by far the most complex. It has a Nelson index, complexity index of 12, making it one of the most sophisticated in Europe, and it is also very profitable. Because of its complexity and the location, I believe it is also of great strategic importance, not least because it provides 20% of the fuel to the southeast and 10% of the fuel for the UK. Unfortunately, because of the way the parent company was structured, when Corriton went into administration, they had no fuel assets and nothing in their bank accounts. But they did have £2 billion worth of debt held in bonds that the parent company had issued. Yes. Do not agree with me how utterly dismaying it must be for the 900 workforce at what was a very successful and profitable refinery mm -hmm. to find they may be losing their jobs now despite the fact that the parent company was able to continue leveraging debt against the successful refinery. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Yes, I should think the, uh, the fact that uh, when the company went into administration it found it had all the debt against the one refinery in Corriton was a shock for all concerned. Uh, and that just shows the mismanagement of the parent company in Switzerland, I think. Um, the administrators once appointed stabilised the situation and started to look at finding a long-term solution. Quickly two options emerged, although I'm sure that many others were looked into. The sale to a third party and financial restructuring. It became fair, although re the financial restructuring started very well, it became fairly obvious fairly quickly that there was a large funding gap and that that was not going to be workable. On the sale side, PwC invited expressions of interest for a sale and numerous options emerged, from a lift and shift to the sale as, as a refinery and finally sale as a fuel terminal, giving a fuel company greater access to the Thames and therefore to the South East. The site has always been recognised as being particularly attractive due to its close proximity to London and its deep water jetty. 
Ironically, these are now to be the refinery's downfall. After examining the offers, I understand that a Russian consortium was identified as having put forward the most favourable bid and wanted to operate the refinery, saving the, two, the 900 to 2,000 jobs it supports, while the next best bid for the site was to be to operate it as a terminal. In light of the announcement yesterday, there have been many who have expressed surprise that no one wanted to buy this site as a refinery. And while I don't have all the details, I do, believe that this I do not believe this to be the case. What I do believe is that there were a number of credible and sustainable bids that were put forward, but none of these ended up to exceed the bid for an alternative use. And I will come back to that later, if I may. Therefore, last month, despite all the hard work, the administrators, PwC, made the announcement, one I think that we had all prayed we would never hear, that there was no credible offer on the table and that there was no one willing to operate the refinery, and therefore they were moving to closure. As I said, I believe there were credible offers on the table, but they were just not high enough. And then yesterday, PwC struck a final blow and announced they had done a deal with Shell to operate the site as a terminal. An announcement timed in advance of tonight's debate, making redundant much of what the case that I wanted to build to save the refinery. But if you will, I will ask you to bear with me. As you can imagine, Mr Deputy Speaker, following that announcement, the situation has been very fluid over the last 24 hours. But the one thing that has been a constant is the number of people and the numerous parties contacting me to express great concern at the way the administration has been conducted. They talk of great secrecy surrounding the sale. They talk that there were alternative outcomes that could have been explored that weren't and that barriers were put up. And these come from a number of sources. After yesterday's announcement, I, have now had a better, I now have a better understanding of the events that led to yesterday's events. And I think it's important that we explore those. My current understanding is that a Russian-led team bid the highest amount and that that bid was processing well until something happened. I have no idea what that something might be. I have a number of ideas, but I cannot confirm any of them. But whatever it was that happened, the upshot was that that information was not communicated, so I am told, properly by the administrators to the buyers. And I have to say, I find that extraordinary. Although in light of my own experiences, not surprising. I have been, uh, I still have not been officially informed by PwC that a deal has been done. Although I have attended every stakeholder meeting, I found out yesterday when the press contacted me, although I did subsequently have an email from uh, one of the partners, VOPAC. Would you keep on that? I will. Um, naturally, because we've actually reached the end game, there's lots of rumour and lots of speculation, and certainly the Russian bidders have been trying to get their case across, uh, having discovered that they've not won the bid. But isn't there also an alternative theory that far from it being in the hands of the administrators, there was a view taken that perhaps they weren't good for the money and they were looking for the opportunity to drop the price? Similarly, uh, obviously we know that Shell are part of the winning consortium. And to be frank, having closed down Shell Haven, and for all the reasons they, the, the supremacy of the location that my Honourable Friends described, wouldn't Shell have gone any price? Uh, well, thank you for making those points. And thank you. It is difficult for me to speculate about what might or might not have happened and what discussions might have taken place. But as I say, it's not just one company who has been in touch with me. Um, and as I say, I do find it extraordinary that the administrators, charged with getting the best deal for the bondholders, who after all they are responsible to, did not inform the company that had the largest bid at the time that there was some form of problem or the situation had changed. Perhaps if things ha uh, had been different, perhaps if the communication had not broken down, we might be, have been in a, a different posi position. Whatever happened, and I don't know what happened, uh, the upshot is that the bid was dropped. And at that point, I believe trust broke down between the administrators and between the Russian consortium wishing to buy the refinery. For the record, I have been aware for some time that uh, both parties uh, in this main bid were represented by PwC. And while I make no comment about the existence of a Chinese war, I would be very interested to hear how both sides viewed the behaviour of the other side. Bear in mind they were both from the same firm. Uh, as I have said on many occasions in the run-up to yesterday, 
there has always been another bidder interested, and I am just concerned that they were not given a fair crack of the whip, and I don't know whether that's true or not. It's a complex situation, and I can't pretend to have the expertise required to pick through the detail and assess the quality of the arguments being made from either side about what happened. On that point, does it not therefore absolutely critical, my uh, colleague's view, that we actually get to the bottom of this for the sake of all those people who may be losing their jobs and other people in the supply chain who absolutely need to know what went on and also that everything possible was done to try and save the, com the company as a going concern? I, I agree entirely with my uh, honourable friend. I think it does highlight that there could have been a different outcome if there had been a greater degree of open sea and transparency on all sides. I don't suggest uh, to uh, attribute fault to anyone, but I do think it does need to be looked at. Um, if, it had been, if there had been more openness, more transparency, maybe the outcome would have been different. Maybe it had been different and more beneficial to the bondholders, but my primary concern is and will continue to be for the workforce who will pay the price for this particular breakdown in communications. For those unfamiliar with the refinery, I just want to put it in some historic context and explain its local importance. South Essex has a long tradition and a long and proud tradition of industrial heritage. At one time, there were three refineries along the Thames. After PwC's announcement, there will be none. So when we talk about the refinery closing, this is not just another business that got into trouble and failed to meet the challenges of the modern world. In fact, it's the contrary to that. It is a very profitable business, was. It met the modern challenges. It was part of our collective DNA in South Essex. It forms the very fabric of society down there. People moved to work there. But the economic impact, if it goes, I think will be the biggest blow. Quickly, because I don't want to use all my time. Thank Thank, you. Thanks very much, and, and uh, I congratulate the Honourable Member for the, this very important debate. I've experienced exactly the same sort of thing in my constituency, and I think you're right in terms of the jobs. But I, I wonder if you agree with me. Thurrock Council did an uh, impact assessment study saying that over £100 million would be lost as a consequence of the closure of the refinery. Why did the government not even ask the European community if indeed there was state aid available to save these jobs? Uh, thank you. Um, those discussions have been taking place uh, behind uh, closed doors and in private, and I'm sure my honourable friend will tell you uh, when he does his response to my uh, arguments what the reasons and what avenues were explored. But what I can tell you is in Thurrock. Uh, Council's economic impact assessment conducted by DTZ, they estimated the impact actually to be no closer to a billion, a billion pounds. Now that represents pot potentially a contraction in economic activity of 0.07% of the national economy. That's getting close to a third of the contraction we experienced in the last quarter. And I, one of my arguments has always been that are we really willing to let that go without exploring every single avenue? And that's one of the questions that I've asked uh, in private, and I'm hopeful that we will hear the answer from the Minister in public this evening. Um, as the House will be aware, over the last few weeks, that call for state aid has been growing, and it's been growing from myself as well. I've raised it on the floor of the House, and as I say, I have raised it in private. Uh, I have asked that Ministers examine every single conceivable angle and check and double-check that there is no way they can help within the boundaries of what is possible. We have to remember that the refinery spends tens of millions of pounds a year on maintenance, on chemicals, on utilities, on business rates. Every three or four years, they have a maintenance project, which is approximately £150 million spent in the UK. That was due to take place this autumn. The impact of this closure will be felt across the whole country. But the hardest hit, of course, will be the those in the local area. The economic cost will be great. In employment terms alone, the closure of Corriton will affect 800 families directly through the loss of employment, let alone those who work for suppliers. This is 800 families who will now have a greater or a more difficult time feeding their families, putting food on the table. And to add salt to that wound, if the planned turnaround project had gone ahead this autumn, the number employed there may well have risen to over 2,000. It is hard to underestimate what a blow this is. We are exporting manufacturing jobs and replacing them with service jobs, and nothing like in the same numbers. I had also hoped 
that despite the work that the Department had undertaken with regard to developing, developing a refining strategy to persuade the Minister to look again at the issue of diesel capacity and had hoped that he might move on that just a little bit. As the Minister will be aware, I and the Government are being accused of not doing enough to support this business, as perhaps the Government did for the banks. So all I can do now is to seek publicly answers to questions that I have put privately for months. I realised that the Government was highly unlikely to be in a position to purchase the business, but I wanted to look for a more imaginative solution where the Government supports the business on a commercial basis or through some form of loan guarantee. So I may, if I may, Mr Deputy Speaker, in light of the above, I would like to put a number of questions to the Minister. Firstly, may I ask the Minister to confirm that he and colleagues from across government looked at every single conceivable angle to provide some form of financial assistance for this business so that it could be kept open. Can the Minister tell the House if he or any of his colleagues received a formal, structured and specific request for state aid from the Administrator, or were the discussions just of a vague nature around it might be helpful if some money was put across? Can he reassure the House that the full level of economic impact was taken into account when they were deciding what, whether or not financial intervention was possible? But by far the biggest impact is on jobs. Can the Minister tell the House what steps he and colleagues from across government are taking to support those who are losing their jobs and when that support will be available? And finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, in light of information that's been handed to me over recent weeks and in light of what I have said this evening and the concern that has been expressed about the process and the way it's been handled and the fact that the refinery is of such significance, will the Minister support my call for a parliamentary inquiry into that process, if for no other reason to ensure that everyone, from the workforce to the bondholders to each and every stakeholder, has been treated fairly by this process? Very briefly, will you? Un Very briefly. Mention. Can I uh, congratulate my honourable friend for the hard work he's done? He knows he's had our supporters in, in his endeavours. But given the, the valid concerns he's raised, can you explain to me where is the downside in having a parliamentary inquiry into this? Uh, can I thank my honourable friend for that intervention? Um, having looked at it, I can't see uh, uh, a downside. I think it would reassure people that this process has been transparent and open and conducted in the way that uh, fulfils all uh, the legal requirements and that there were no other options. I don't want to give false hope, but I do want to give those assurances that there could have been no other possible outcome than the one that was announced yesterday. This is a sad day for the UK refining industry. It's a sad day for South Essex, and it's a sad day for all those who have worked and been connected with the refinery in the past. But above all, Mr Deputy Speaker, it is a very, very sad day for the hundreds of people who are currently working at the refinery, who after yesterday's announcement will no longer have a safe and secure job and will be looking for new employment. I ask the Minister to do whatever he can to address the points that I have raised. Yeah, yeah, Thank you. Yeah. Minister. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, can I begin by thanking my honourable friend for securing this debate and also for the way in which he has introduced it. Throughout the period of these months that he has been completely assiduous in raising concerns with me and my fellow ministers about the concerns which he has about the situation, he has pursued every opportunity to engage and to advocate the outcome which he and I would have wished, and he could not have been more diligent in representing his constituents. Uh, and I also thank him for the way in which he's done it, that uh, there are some who believe that the best way of doing this is in a blaze of media attention. But even sometimes that may secure a short-term political benefit, but it actually makes complex legal and in economic discussions that much more complicated. Yeah. And I absolutely yeah. welcome the approach which he has taken of doing this quietly, persistently, in a focused and diligent way, even if it has still not delivered the outcome that he and I would have wished. And I'm grateful too to my other colleagues, my right honourable friend, the member for Rayleigh, my uh, honourable friend, the member for uh, South End West, my, for Rochford and South End East, Basildon and Billericay, Castle Point, uh, Thurrock. Uh, and uh, for uh, my friend from Priscilla Pembroke as well, who takes a great interest in these matters, even though he's on the other side of the country, but with a significant refinery of his own uh, to look after. 
Uh, this has been an extremely difficult period, and that we are all profoundly disappointed, and especially for those who have been working so diligently at the refinery, that the uh, administrator has not been able to find somebody who would continue refining at Corriton. The inevitable job losses is something that we all hope could be avoided. But it has been an extraordinary example of a community pulling together. It's a tribute to the management of the plant, to the trades unions, to the local community as led by their local councils and local members of parliament, who could not have presented a more seamless and supportive case to the administrator in their work. I want to reassure him the government is doing everything we can to ensure that the skilled people who have been working at Corriton find jobs and find new posts. And we're working with the Thurrock Council Task Force, local agencies and the Job Centre Plus to ensure they get the support they need at this difficult time. But we do need to look at some of the background. Petroplus went into administration in January, and since then the administrators have been working tirelessly to find a buyer for the refinery. They put in place an innovative tolling arrangement with Morgan Stanley, who agreed to supply crude oil to the refi refinery so it could continue operating whilst a buyer was found. This was a similar arrangement to the one which the French government and Shell had put in place at the Petit Coron refinery in France. That tolling arrangement was extended until the end of May, but it ended on the 28th of May. And at that point, because no similar arrangement could be negotiated for taking it forward, the administrators had to take the difficult decision to start shutting down the refinery. Corriton has now ceased commercial refining and is in the process of being shut down. The first wave of redundancies are happening this week, and our thoughts are with those people who are affected. The administrators have offered explicit guarantees that all workers made redundant would receive their statutory redundancy entitlements, and we will do all we can to ensure that these are processed as quickly as possible. Over the past five months, the administrators have worked exceptionally hard to find a buyer, and in government we did everything that we could to support them in this task. We work with the administrators early on to look at the options for the refinery's future. We convened a number of stakeholder meetings to ensure everyone was aware of what was happening and UKT was in involved in looking for potential investors. My honourable friend raised particular issues about the engagement with Fund Energy, and I be re reassured today by the administrators and representatives of Fund Energy on, uh, that they have met them on a continual basis throughout this process. They say they continue to do so right up until the final decision was made. And I, but I do believe that from the assurances I've had from the administrators, they've complied with their statutory duties. Uh, I will give Babe extremely briefly. Thanks very much, uh, Mr Speaker, and I'm grateful to the Minister. And uh, I, uh, Clearly, we share the concerns of all of the, uh, the people who are affected by this, but the Minister is well aware that Corriton isn't unique. In fact, it's, I think it's a microcosm of the UK refining industry at the moment. There isn't a single refiner refinery in the country which is making money, and many are losing large sums of money, and that's bound to get worse when EU emission requirements uh, come into uh, place later. And the future of Corriton seems to be as a storage facility, probably from a pipeline that, uh, bringing petrol in from Rotterdam, a subsea pipeline. Isn't the Minister and isn't the Government worried about what that implies for the security of our supplies in the future? I will respond absolutely specifically to the point which the Honourable Gentleman has made, because it's absolutely the heart of the situation we face. Uh, now, the UK does face extremely tough competition from other refineries in Europe and increasingly in, in Asia. It's well known that there is overcapacity in the refinery sector in the UK and right across Europe. Eight European refineries have closed since 2009, and more closures are expected to happen in the future. The IEA has reported that since 2008 and 2009, more than three million barrels of oil per day of crude distillation capacity has closed, and with more at risk. At the same time, significant refinery expansions are taking place in Asia in particular, outpacing expected demand growth. All of this means that, as the Honourable Gentleman says, profit margins are low for refineries in the UK. Secondly, the United Kingdom refineries broadly produce the right amount of fuel to meet demand in the United Kingdom, but they don't produce the right type of fuel. Put simply, we put, produce more petrol than we consume, and we use much more diesel than we produce. Since 2000, demand for petrol in the UK has decreased by 35 per cent, by over a third, whilst demand for diesel has increased by 34 per cent. These are evidently sustained trends and not a short-term blip. 
and overall there has been a 9% decrease in the demand for fuel in the last decade due to economic conditions and better, better fuel economy from new cars. That we have now put in place work to develop a diesel and a refining strategy. This is something that should have happened long ago, right the way through the last administration, where there was a 34% drop in demand for diesel. This was evident, uh, sorry, demand for petrol. This was an entirely evident trend, and it is a great shame that that work wasn't started yeah. before yeah, now, yeah, yeah. so that we could actually have a more structured approach. Thirdly, significant levels of capital investment were needed in the Corriton refinery to maintain refinery operations. This included the cost of the three yearly turnaround, around 150 million, and any expenditure on adaptation to rebalance output between petrol and diesel products, which would have cost in the order of hundreds of millions. And these evidently posed a massive barrier to potential new owners. In addition, the Corriton site is of exceptional value as an import terminal because of its location and its amenities, with one of the biggest jetties anywhere. So it's not surprising that it had a higher sale value as an import terminal, which do does not require the extra investment a refinery would need. And so it is very clear that it is a very tough market, and these conditions made the sale of Corriton as a refinery challenging. Now, I want to reassure the House, and my honourable friend in particular, the Government gave very careful consideration to whether financial assistance could be provided. There are extensive discussions between my Department, the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills and the Treasury. Right across Government, all Government departments which were appropriately involved were involved. But whilst the Government, like the Honourable Member, acknowledges that it would have wished to have seen a different outcome, we did not believe it was right to put public money into a refinery. No, uh, forgive me. Forgive money. me. Um, firstly, as I mentioned earlier, the overcapacity. Uh, uh, the over this is a half-hour debate, and there is not time to take further interventions. Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, there is existing overcapacity in the refining industry in the UK and Europe, and declining demand for petrol means that it would not have been sustainable to put public money into refinery. Secondly, putting public money into refinery would not have been a long-term solution. Simply funding the gap between the bid for an import terminal and the bid for refinery would not have guaranteed the long-term commercial success of the refinery, and it's clear that significant investment would have been needed over time to keep the refinery open. Finally, I was reassured by the Government's work with fuel suppliers that Corriton's closure would not have an impact on the security of supply of fuel to London and the South East, as there are many other supply points and operational refineries which could be used. My, my honourable friend asked specific questions in relation to this, uh, the, uh, whether the uh, formal request was made. A formal request was made uh, by the administrators on the 15th of May to, with regard to the provision of government assistance for one option of a number which they were looking at at that time. Uh, these negotiations are inevitably controversial, but it was only one of the options on the table at the time which would have required it. And when we're considering the case for financial assistance, a range of issues were included. And these include the impact of security of supply, the impact on energy resilience, and the impact on jobs and the local community. And we concluded that on each of these grounds, there was not sufficiently compelling case to intervene. And because that was so clear to us, there was not a case for seeking approval from the Commission, because it would simply not have been considered. Now, whilst we accepted it is extremely sad news that the refinery is going to close. Uh, I do hope that there is some comfort from the new facility in terms of the investment which that will bring in as an import terminal. But my honourable friend put to me a couple of additional questions which I want to focus on in these remaining moments. He asked whether there should be a parliamentary inquiry. Um, I think that that is a matter uh, for the Select Committee to take forward, and in view of the work which we're doing on a long-term strategic approach to this, I would welcome that sort of investigation. We would work very closely with them. But I think it's unlikely that it could be done on the timescale to make any difference uh, to the situation at Corriton. But I would also, in view of the comments he's made in the debate tonight, write to PricewaterhouseCoopers in the morning to ask them to respond formally to each and every point which he has made and to seek the assurances which they should be giving him uh, about the process which has been involved. We found them very professional, we found them very thorough, and I think it is only right that he and his constituents have answers to every question. We're now moving forward with Thurrock taking the lead in the task force and through the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills. We will do everything possible to bring uh, new jobs and new prosperity to this area. My honourable friend has fought a, a diligent battle. Uh, I am profoundly saddened. Order. Order. This House now stands adjourned.